And we begin today with a new report out by the Associated Press that exposes a secretive program once employed by the CIA at Guantanamo Bay. The initiative was called Penny Lane, and it referred to a special detention facility that had one focus, to turn al-Qaeda-connected detainees into double agents. After vigorous training in a special facility, those chosen detainees were sent back to their home countries and told to infiltrate terrorist groups in order to help the U.S. capture and kill al-Qaeda operatives. Of course, this was risky considering that these prisoners could renege on their deal with the U.S. and instead turn to kill Americans. But as the AP reports, quote, for the CIA, that was an acceptable risk. For the American public, which was never told, the program was one of the many secret trade-offs the government made on its behalf. At the same time, the government used the risk of terrorism to justify imprisoning people indefinitely. It was releasing dangerous people from prison to work for the CIA. So here to give us a little more perspective on this, I'm joined by Colonel Morris Davis, former chief prosecutor at Guantanamo Bay and currently a law professor at Howard University. Colonel, thank you so much for joining me. Sure. First of all, this is a pretty shocking report, and it seems it was all sort of based on anonymous sources. Did you know this was going on at all? Well, I'd heard rumors of the different programs, you know, Strawberry Fields and then uh, Penny Lane as well. But uh, by the time I came on board in September of 2005, these were, uh, you know, already in the past. So they really did keep this under wraps. W what was the process for vetting these de detainees? I mean, how um, would the government have known that people weren't a detainees weren't lying about um, what their connections were just to essentially get out of Gitmo. Right. I don't know. I wasn't involved in those programs, but I would assume like in many uh, organized crime cases, sometimes you got to make a deal with the devil to try to get someone further up the food chain. I can tell you it caused some uh, consternation for my prosecutors though, because in some cases we were asking them to prosecute people for war crimes and they're saying, wait a minute, you want me to prosecute the lieutenant at this level? but we've let his colonel go, which right. created this kind of paradox of, uh, at Guantanamo, where if you were a big enough fish, you potentially got a free ticket home and a wad of cash to take with you. If you weren't, you could potentially got prosecuted. And if you're in that lower category, the people that have been cleared, you're still at Guantanamo in indefinite detention. So the more guilty you are uh, may have been better for you. Wow, sounds like a two-tiered justice system there. Um, well, considering what we've seen happen in Afghanistan, in which you know U.S. troops in many cases have right. become the target of uh, Afghan soldiers who turned on them, how risky was this program really? And uh, you know, what does it say about the lengths the U.S. was willing to go to at the time? Well, it's impossible to tell without having access to those programs to be able to assess what the outcomes were. You really sure. can't tell. But it, it's interesting because you hear that a certain percentage of the detainees that were released from, from Guantanamo uh, were recidivist. And that's one of the arguments for not releasing some of the people that are still there now. It would be interesting to know how many of these people that were released from Guantanamo that we count as being recidivist, because clearly they went back to their organizations because that's what we paid them to do. Are they counted as part of the recidivist group or not? And if not, it would identify who they were. So right. I suspect they're counted in that number. Right, right. Well, the AP report says that, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda actually suspected that the CIA might attempt to do something like this. Therefore, um, they were always very wary of former Gitmo right. detainees. Um, so knowing that, how successful could this program really have been? I don't know. Again, I think it would depend on the individual and how successful they were in convincing the leadership that uh, they were legitimate and uh, proving their, you know, bona fides when they got back to the organization. But uh, you know, it's Hopefully interesting. Hopefully we'll get this information. Well, it took this yeah. long to find out about uh, what we know now, so maybe in another five or ten, ten years, years we'll, we'll get... find out more. Right. Well, when this program was taking place, Bush administration officials often, you know, villainized Gitmo prisoners. Uh, Dick Cheney called them, quote, the worst of a very bad lot. Remsfeld uh, said that they were, quote, among the most dangerous, best trained, vicious killers on the face of the earth. Was that an accurate portrayal of everyone no that was there. it clearly wasn't and it was a real disservice to the country and to our whole reputation you know as being a champion of the rule of law I mean, there clearly are people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Al Nashiri there are people that really do qualify for that description but for every one of those or a hundred more that uh, were the sure. you know the, the dupes that got picked up on the battlefield or sold for a bounty and wound up at Guantanamo and unfortunately 
a majority of the men that are there now are people that have been cleared to be transferred out that our government has said we have no reason to keep. But year after year, they sit there at, what, two and a half million dollars each per year just right. uh, biding their time at Guantanamo. Yeah, it truly is a shame. You know, of course, the only things that American Americans heard at the time were the things that Bush officials were telling them. Um, if this program had been exposed, you know, in 2004, 2005, when the program was going on, do you think um, Americans would have even cared? I mean, considering that Probably. was their impression of Gitmo detainees. Probably not. I mean, the, you know, it's hard to get Americans interested in Guantanamo regardless of the topic. And I think the fact that uh, the agency tried to flip some of the detainees to use as assets I don't think would shock anyone here. But again, it creates that, uh, that, that odd paradox where if you're guilty enough, then you potentially get a free ticket home. And if you're not, then you could potentially spend the rest of your life sitting at Guantanamo. Right. Well, interestingly, Obama did ask about this program when he came into office in, in 2009, and he allegedly ordered a review of the double agents because they were providing information for uh, the use of predator drones and such. Right. What do you think his intentions were with that? I mean, do you think that it, it's at all possible that there could possibly be double agents helping to aid the drone program? It's certainly a possibility because too often in this war on terror, you've seen people use, uh, you know, play the U.S. as a pawn to, to get revenge or to settle a score with, with someone else. So we really don't know. I mean, I think there's a strong likelihood that uh, some of the targets that were identified were probably identified people that, uh, you know, did it for their own personal reasons and, you know, which segues nicely into your next story on the drone program uh, that the CIA continues to operate just as they operated Penny Lane at Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. And when you were, uh, you know, working at, uh, with Guantanamo, were there other kinds of deals, uh, you know, plea bargains? I mean, is this essentially the way things were run? I mean, it's, there certainly were. I mean, certainly in the time I was there, we uh, tried to cut deals with some of the detainees in order to uh, gain their cooperation, which is typical, you know, in any criminal prosecution. You try to make, uh, you know, deals with people in order to, to work your way up, up the chain of command. Um, and what kinds of things were they promised in return? Well, by the time, when I, the time I resigned, we'd never successfully concluded a negotiation. We were just in the talking stage. And so the last time I visited with some of the detainees at Guantanamo was to find out what they would be interested in in return for their cooperation. And then before I had a chance to go back, uh, you know, I resigned. So my understanding is in some of the subsequent cases, uh, for instance, Majid Khan was one of the high value detainees who has pled guilty, but his sentence is being held in abeyance in order for him to cooperate and potentially testify in some of the upcoming trials. And assuming he does cooperate, then he'll get the benefit of his uh, cooperation at his sentencing. But, uh, we, you know, it's yet to be determined right. what, if anything, his cooperation Very will get for him. interesting. Well, things are certainly stalled over there. We do appreciate uh, you coming mm -hmm. here and sharing your insight. As always, Colonel Morris Davis, former chief prosecutor at Guantanamo Bay and law professor at Howard University. Thank you. Sure.